Hi everyone, uh, Teng Bu again from Capital Dynamics. Good to see you again once a week. Uh, before I continue with uh, the topic for this week, which is about the population problem facing America versus the problem facing China. Before I go into that, let me just quickly uh, share with you that our ICAP fan club is now accepting members. In fact, uh, we have already received quite a lot of uh, membership, even though we've just emailed out maybe about more or less a week ago. So for those of you who are interested, this is the first corporate fan club in the entire Asia Pacific. Yeah, it is it is not part, it is not owned by iCapital.bizberhat, but they are associated, right? And this corporate friend club, which is belonging to which is part of iCapital.bizberhat, is open only to individual share owners of iCap. So for those of you who want to have a bit more fun, a bit more excitement, and make new friends, enjoy yourself, please come visit iCapFanClub.com. You can get the details inside there, you can get the application form inside there. And uh, do it fast because the first 300 members will get the iCap Fan Club t-shirt for free. It's, it's worth a lot, you know, it's worth a lot. The other thing that I want to remind good folks out there is the fund gathering for all the iCapital funds. These are the, not the listed fund, not the close end fund. This is the iCapital China fund, the iCapital ASEAN fund, the iCapital International Value fund, the iCapital Global fund, the iCapital Asia Pacific fund. So for all those funds, we are having our annual gathering on Saturday, the 4th of May. If you like more details, please go to our website, events.icapital.biz. You can get all the details inside there and you can register yourself there. Remember, 4th of May, Saturday. And for those of you who have been tracking uh, major events globally, you know that we are facing an uncertain, a really uncertain period. You heard probably the headlines where Israel launched missile attacks on Iran. So this tit for tat, Israel says it is in response to Iran's drone attack. Iran says it is due to the attack on the Iranian embassy in Syria. It's getting, it's escalating, it's getting worse. They are attacking each country's uh, territory directly. And what will happen next? Uh, I don't know. I really don't know. On top of that, you have the U.S. economy still extremely overheated. Inf inflation is coming back. And this is before the oil price. Oil price jump up, of course, in reaction to this uh, latest development in the Middle East. So what is happening to this world? Yesterday, Friday, the Nikkei index plunged 1,000 over points. So for those of you who are thinking what to do in this kind of calamitous situation, come 4th May, Saturday, attend our fun gathering. So those are the two uh, introductions that I would like to get out of my way before I dive into the main topic of today. We have said that in our uh, pre-event, pre-recording publicity, we said, we posed the question, is the population situation in U.S. more serious than the population problem in China? Because, you know, in the, in the Western media, you really have all kinds of negative, all kinds of anti-China reporting, almost every day, every hour, right? And a popular problem 
that the Western media, the Western think tank and observers like to use to convince other people that the Chinese economy is declining or peaking is the population issue, the demographic issue. You know, they'll tell you China's population, China will become old before it can get rich, that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, rubbish. So are these people correct? You look at the headlines that I show you here. This is from a very famous American think tank, CSIS, right, dot, uh, dot org. One of their articles, how severe are China's demographic challenges? These sort of headlines can be found. It is very commonplace. And if you look at how they explain in their introduction, China's changing demographic pose major prolonged challenges for the country and its leaders. China has for decades reaped the economic dividends that came with having a young workforce to fuel China's emergence as a global industrial powerhouse. Now, according to this article, the number of Chinese retirees will soon skyrocket, reducing the size of China's workforce and putting pressure on China's social safety net and healthcare system. I've given you the source. You can click it yourself and read whatever they want to write. I mean, uh, there's this, this, this sort of narrative. It's very common. This I'm giving you just one simple example. But what I want to show you is the facts. The facts which are not reported, which somehow is hidden. You cannot find it in the Western media. You can only get it from Capital Dynamics YouTube channel. Because we go down, we dig into the facts, the underlying facts, and then get truth from there. So if you look at, let's say, the world's most populous countries. This is 2024, and uh, it's from the same source, as you know. India has recently uh, gone ahead of, in, of China a little bit. One is about 1.44 billion, one is about 1.42 billion. Give or take, you know, these sort of numbers, when you have one over a billion people, how accurate can your numbers be? Anyway, China remains a very highly populated country. Why am I showing this to you? Because when you look at demographic situation, whether there are challenges or whether they're going to be population dividend, demographic dividend, the absolute number matters. It's not just percentages. Like for example, you use an extreme example of Singapore, right? Five, six million people versus China or India, 1.4 billion. Of course, if China's population were to drop by 2%, that's almost like the entire population of Singapore wiped out. So if you look at the demographic situation from an absolute numbers perspective, India and China are in their, own, in their own category, in their own league. America is still way behind. The difference between America's population and China's population is 1.1 billion people. 1.1 billion people is equivalent to the entire Western economies. It's like you combine Germany, uh, France, Britain, Australia, Canada with US, you still don't get to China's population. So the 1.1 billion absolute difference is very important when you're talking about the impact of demography on economic development, economic growth. Okay, that's the first point. Then let's look at the second one, which is the more common one. Oh, China's growth rate is declining, it is going to disappear, blah, blah, blah. But when you look at the facts, these facts are from World Bank, a very neutral source. The red line represents the population growth in China, the blue line, America. And by 2021, you look at the growth rate of both countries, they are, first thing, heading in the same direction, and in terms of the percentage change, 
They're about the same. Maybe difference of 0 0.1, 0 0.2, give or take. And before the early 90s, China's population growth was way faster than America. Much, much, more than double. Then, of course, due to the one-child policy, China's population growth rate started to fall. But even by now, they're quite close to one another. Right? And if you look at the next one, which is even more dramatic, they will say, oh, China will get old before she gets rich. America is a much older country than China. Do you know that? The people age 65 and above, as a percentage of total population for America, is almost 18%. China is about 14%. And the gap between US and China has only started to narrow in the last 10 to 12 years. Before that, the gap between US and China was actually very wide, as you can see in the red and the blue line. Right? Then the situation in US is even more serious than what just this diagram shows you. We'll take a look at the next one. US older population, those age 65 and above, you know, people like me, like 70 years old and above, right, grew from 2010 to 2020 at the fastest rate since the late 19th century. From 1920 to 2020, that's 100 years, the population age 65 and above in America jumped up five times in that 100 years. Now, in 2020, this older generation, the elderly population of America is already 56 million and above, around that figure. Let's take a look at the next figure. This one shows you the increase even in a more dramatic manner. The one at the top, the blue column, is the number of people age 65 and above in the United States in terms of as absolute number. By 2020, it is 50 plus million people. And the one in red line at the bottom is the same uh, fact, except that it is presented as a percentage of total population. 100 years ago, it was only about 5%. Now, it is 18, 19, 20%. That is dramatic aging. That's only 100 years. So imagine, if you project another 30 years, 50 years, you're going to see a lot of old Americans, I mean, old people like me, on the roads. So this is not highlighted in the sense that you haven't seen a comparison between the old population in America versus the old population in China. On this, in this case, China wins. In the case of population growth in percentage terms, both countries are quite close to one another. But when it comes to 65 and above, China wins. Let's look at the next one. This is, you look at the, the, the country that is holding the world record, of course, is Japan, the world famous Japan, where almost, this at 2020, almost 29% of Japanese are age 65 and above. I'm, I'm an elderly citizen, right? Why would I want to go to a country where almost 30%, a third of the people are old people like me? I want to go to a country where there are more young people. So Japan is way on top. And United States, somewhere at the lower part, 16.8%. If you look on the left-hand side, what are the countries that have got old people? After Japan, Italy, Greece, Germany, Finland, Slovenia, Croatia, Romania, Estonia, Portugal, France. What is common? These are all European countries. Now you may ask, hello, 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 you look, 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 look. At the bottom is New Zealand, right? How come China doesn't appear there? How come China doesn't appear in this ranking uh, table here? Wow, another fact. Because the percentage of people age 65 and above in China is way below this, the figures 
even it's way even below New Zealand. It's only fourteen percent. So get fact number three correct, right? Then let's move on to fact number four. The working age part, the fifteen to sixty-four. That is the working age population generally. Uh, commonly accepted definition. Again, eh? Did did I draw this diagram correct? Did I label it correctly? The working age population as a percentage of total population in America is much lower than in China. Woo! That's what they didn't tell you, right? United States has only this up to 2020 has only 65 percent. Now, despite all the Negative narrative, the big hula balu about China's population problem, China still has 69%. Now, that is a huge gap. Five percentage points is a huge gap. Because as I mentioned earlier, the absolute number matters. For China, right, 69% of 1.4 over billion people. For United States, 65% of only 300 over million people. So America has Population, working population is tiny and shrinking. China's working population is large and also falling. But if you look at the red line, the working age population of China was actually at a higher percentage was increasing until recently, until only about 14, 15 years ago. So if you have such a big number, 69%, in the working age population. That means your, your population size has got to shrink by a lot, a lot before it can really adversely impact your economic growth and economic development. Because China is also enjoying, particularly in, in the recent years, talent dividend. China has invested a lot in R&D. The R&D as a percentage of GDP, China is catching up with America. China is now the second largest R&D spender in the world, close, closing the gap with the United States. And of course, China has got huge number of STEM graduates, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, the largest in the world. So China will be enjoying this talent dividend. So this is another fact that the working age population of China is far from being such a headwind that the Western media has been writing on. Let's look at another fact. The converse of that, the young population. Hello? You look at 2020, the young population dose from day one to 14 years old as a percentage of total population in China is about the same as in the United States of America. They are about 17-18%. And China has only dropped to America's level only recently, only in the last, uh, about the last 20 years. Before that, the young population as a percentage of China's population was way more than America. So from all factual angles, America's demographic problem is actually far worse than China. But did the Western media tell you that? Did the Western think tank tell you that? I haven't seen research articles from the West that compares the demographic problem of US and China in an objective manner. I haven't seen that. Let's take a look at another one. Right? So when we look at facts, like I said, the US is actually in a far worse population problem than China is. But then what they'll tell you is, oh, you know, America has consistent net inflow of migrants to alleviate the population problem. Well, China does not have. China has very low level of uh, foreigners staying, coming to China, right? Now, if you dig deeper and look at the situation objectively, the reason for this divergence is very simple. Very simple. First thing is the U.S. has been suffering from a severe population for a very long time, very long time, and has resorted to immigration a long time ago. 
If you remember, until not long ago, China actually suffered from having too many people. That's why they had the one-child policy in 1981, because there are so many, you know, the children keep coming out. So that's why they had to manage the situation. And if you want to follow the path of America in relying on migrants, China can always open up and can very quickly attract millions of migrants if the need arises. Let me explain to you. I want to carry these two points a little bit further. Next. Now, let's take a look at this diagram. This is uh, the purple line is number of my immigrants into America, right? And the blue line is the share of immigrant share of U.S. population. The percentage share is uh, relatively stable, about between 5 to 15 percent, 5 to 15 percent, right? But it's the purple line, the number of immigrants that has changed dramatically, especially from the 1970 onwards. That's when suddenly a huge uh, influx of immigrants came into America. So what happened was, in the past, especially before the uh, 1960s and so on, most of the immigrants into America were from Europe, Britain and Europe. That has declined. So from the 60s and the 70s onward, the large number, the overwhelming number of immigrants coming into America were from Latin America and Asia. Latin America means like Mexico. Asia means uh, China, India, Vietnam, those Asian countries. That The ethnic composition of immigrants into the United States has changed completely. Pro-Europe, pro-UK, now to pro-Hispanics, pro-Asians. That has a lot, of, a lot of long-term implication. Next. You look at this diagram. It's interesting, right? It shows you by states in America, the most commonly spoken language other than English and Spanish, because Spanish, the Hispanics form a large percentage of America's population. Other than English and, Sp and Spanish, you look at the western side, the Washington state, Oregon, California, Chinese is the most common, right? And then you go into uh, the Iowa, the Idaho, and so on, the, uh, that part, you have German. Then you go into the middle part where you have Texas uh, and so on, you have Vietnamese. And then you go into uh, below Chicago, you have mixture. You have German, Chinese, Polish, Vietnamese, Korean, Arabic, French, uh, Somali, all kinds. Hmong, Hmong is from Laos. And then you go to the eastern side. Again, you see Chinese. And then you go to Florida, Haitian. And then you go to the top, you get French, Portuguese. So, what you can think of is, you can think of America as a melting pot. That's fine, that's possible. Or you can look at it in a different way when you do your projection. You're going to see for the first time in American society a real roja of languages, a real diversity of uh, racial origins, cultural practices, and so on. Now, if America is a strong democracy, has got political stability, matured, responsible politicians, maybe this diversity may work out well. But project, you look at what is happening to the American political system. It is so divided. The country is so divided. And a person like Trump is still wanting to come back for the 2024 presidential election. It's, you know, it's, it's unbelievable because in 2020, his followers, his supporters, 
actually took over the capital, the capital of Washington, which is like, it's like stage, it's also, it's almost like staging a military coup. And yet he's coming in as the next, uh, coming in in the 2024 presidential uh, election. So America's politics, they are very different from what it used to be a long time ago. And the division is going to get worse by a lot of factors. First thing is, like I told you, the ethnic composition of immigrants coming in is going to be very different from the past. That is going to change the ethnic landscape of America's population. As you can see in this diagram here, languages. There's going to be so many languages that are going to be commonly used in the United States. Next. And look on your right hand side. This is the educational attainment of US population. Those who are age 25 and above in 2022. On the right hand side, right? Take a look. US born is purple in color, 36%. The one in the middle is all immigrants, right? And then the one with the, uh, what do you call that? The slanted light blue lines, that is recently uh, arrived immigrants. So you notice, the recently arrived immigrants have got are better qualified. And remember I told you, the recent immigrants are mainly from Asia, India, China, Vietnam, Philippines, Indonesia, that kind of country. So what you're going to have is an increasing number of Asian immigrants who are better qualified, having better jobs in better positions. So what happens to the white Americans who are not so well educated, who may not have that kind of income prospects, that kind of career prospects? Don't you think there's going to be a lot of frustration? I mean, after all, it was the anger and frustration of the American middle, middle income people, the Midwest people that voted Trump in in the first place. So do this projection where you're going to see more fault lines along in the American society. Would American democracy really function in that kind of condition? I have my question marks. I have a lot of reservations, I have a lot of doubts. Let's take a look at another diagram. Uh, this is also to show you the top metropolitan areas of residence for immigrants into the US in the period 2018 to 2022. You notice they are very focused in a few areas. On the left hand side, you have uh, San Francisco in the middle, and then Los Angeles, San Diego at the bottom. That's the California state. A bit in Texas, in uh, Austin and so on. And then on the northeastern side, you have the New York, Boston, the Philadelphia, the New Jersey. And then in the southern side, you have Florida. So you have a pattern where immigrants Ethnicity has changed, educational attainment of the new immigrants are at a higher level, and these immigrants seem to be going to certain concentrated areas. What does that mean? It means that a lot of areas of America would have white Americans who are going to be very unhappy especially when there's a recession. A recession will come to the U.S. that naturally. I mean, I, if you ask me to take a guess, I probably think that 2024 will see a recession in America. So hard times will come. Then you have a political system, a democracy that is not stable, that is extremely uh, taking extreme views and do not make decisions on a rational basis. What do you get? You don't get roja. You get, I don't know, a cauldron. 
you get like a, a, a steamboat with boiling water in it. So I can't imagine in the longer term the demographic situation that America faces is going to lead to a lot more serious problems than America is having now. Then let's take a look at in the case of China, right? I mean, I just show you a bit of the key timelines in Chinese population control. 1981, Deng Xiaoping launched the one child policy. 2017, it ended because now they can have two children. 2022, you can have three child policy. So far, we have not seen the results yet because the easing of the one child policy unfortunately coincided with the pandemic. And that is probably the worst time to have a child. Because if you look at almost every country in the world, population or birth rates all decline in 2020, 2021, in almost every country. I mean, obviously, right? You can't really do much during the pandemic. So, whether the relaxation of the one-child policy will bring benefits is still a question mark. But I think you might not be able to get maximum benefits from this relaxation, but you get a certain amount of benefits. It's definitely a lot more beneficial than having the one-child policy. And when good times come back, when the Chinese economy uh, strengthen, grows further, and the quality of its industrial and economic growth and development improve, changes for the better, people will be more willing to have more children. So I see the birth rates in China either stabilizing or even improving. Now that's on the population growth side. But what about attracting foreigners to come into China? Most People, I mean, if you read, like I said, the Western narrative, it's always uh, very negative about China. China is a closed society, blah, blah, blah. That's why you have so few foreigners there. That's not true. That's factually wrong. Let's take a look at the next one. This is a book, an academic book written by Professor uh, Valerie Hansen. Uh, this is a new second edition. It's about China being an open empire. So what she does is she study the cultural and social history of China right, and look at China from a different perspective up to the Qing dynasty, up to 1800. So it's, she started from the very early days of China all the way up to about 1800. That's a long period of time. So what his research has found is that this book offers a fresh approach to Chinese history. The chronological narrative rests on a rich variety of archaeological and literary sources that eliminate the, eliminate the details of daily life family relations, and social hierarchies. People who are covered in the pages are nobles, peasants, women, students, writers, and rebels, each offering a distinctive and colourful perspective. Now, what is important is this, the second part. This book, The Open Empire, highlights China's many borrowings from her neighbours from the spread of Buddhism from India after the fall of the Han dynasty to the interaction between the Tang dynasty China and the Islamic world, other cultures have continuously influenced China. Valerie Hansen, Han, Hansen shows China to have an open, dynamic history, not one that is isolated and unchanging, and so she places China in a global context. I, the best thing is for you to buy the book and read it. It's very academic. It's uh, not a storybook. But if you're interested, uh, you find a lot of things 
that you are not aware of. For example, she explains to you why uh, China is called, what, what, what Chong Kuo means. In the Western narrative, they always say, oh, Chong Kuo means Middle Kingdom, that China is so arrogant, thinks that China is in the center of the world. She explains, Valerie Hansen explains to you, no, that is not what Chong Kuo means. Chong Kuo means during that warring period where there were a lot of states fighting one another, this is just the central states. So it doesn't mean Middle Kingdom, it means central states. Anyway, this book is available, I think. You can buy it, read it, and then you find that the Chinese society has always been open. And it is open again. You can see now, there are so many countries that you, you, there are so many countries where the people can enter China without any visa. Thailand and China have got a permanent visa-free arrangement. And as more flights get connected, as more people uh, recover from the era of the shock, the trauma of pandemic, the interactions between China and the rest of the world will blossom. So will China be able to attract the millions of immigrants that America does? Certainly, I'm sure. If you talk to people, I mean, for those of you who have not been to China, please visit China. For those of you who have been to China recently, you know how advanced China is. Not, I'm not just talking about Shanghai. Wherever you go, you know, last year I went to the, one of the most rural areas in Fujian province, where my ancestors used to, 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 to come from. This is, you know, China has got a city tiering system, tier 1, tier 2, tier 3. This town that my ancestor came from is so lowly ranked that it's not even tier 5. It's uh, Meishen, Meishen uh, Chen in uh, near Nan'an. But in this pretty backward rural area of China, you know what? I get 5G internet in the hotel room, which is modern, very clean, very advanced, 5G internet, which was faster than the internet in my own office. So if you look at the infrastructure, the development, the growth that China has experienced, a lot, a lot of people, international people who have been to China will be more than happy to stay there and if possible to get a PR. And for those of you who are not familiar, for those of you who are women and so on, almost every part of China is safe for women to travel alone. If you walk Shanghai at 12 midnight alone as a woman, I can almost guarantee you nothing will happen to you. So is China going to be attractive to all the millions of immigrants? 100% yes. So let me come back to my main topic. Has America got a more serious demographic problem than China has? Certainly. As I mentioned to you, the next 10, 20 years, America is going to see a more chaotic society, a more dangerous society. Whereas China will progress prosperously and peacefully. So I hope you enjoy listening to all the facts. I'm sure the facts would have shocked you, but let me assure you, I double check my facts. Right? And if you like what we say, if you like our YouTube channel, please subscribe to it, please share it, please like it, and pass the word around. Because the more people know what truth is, the better the world will be. So I hope you have a good weekend, and see you again next week.